<coughs> I showed Rita this, uh, it's a ruler. Just an itsy bitsy little ruler, right? She gave me this 25 years ago in Don and Pauline's basement while we were having Bible studies. It's over 25 years. It's over 25 now? Yeah, okay. 30 years. 30. Well, 1989. Yeah, 30 years, like almost. Whew. And she gave me this pen, like, you know, because I always underline things in my book. This pen has been responsible for 99.9% .9 of every line in my Bibles. And I, I've lost it a couple times. I keep finding it, though. Well, if you saw my desk, you'd understand what I mean. But So everybody should have a, a ruler that they underline, that they use to underline in their Bibles with special Pigma pens, 005 Pigma pens. Remember those, Kenny? I introduced you guys to the, those pens 30 years ago, right? Well, Kenny knew. Pens too. Pens too. Pens too. The fine. Yeah, the fine ones. Ah, see? Yeah, I remember that. Exactly. I probably have 50 of those. Those are great because they don't smear in your Bible. They last forever. Regular ink. You know, 15 years from now, you'll go, what used to be here? Because yeah. it will have smeared and oh, wow. in your Bible. Oh, These pens, they're the greatest things. <clears throat> All right, well, before you open your Bibles this morning, it's Colossians chapter 1. I mentioned last week that I was going to do something special this Sunday. And that's what these sheets are about. And what I want to do is help people to, people who want to share the Word of God rightly divided, and they want to be successful at it. I'm going to share something with you this morning and what prompted me to do this is you know I get emails all the time and many of the emails that I receive are from people who are frustrated because the people they're talking to just don't get it they just don't get it they just can't see what they're saying they end up in arguments they end up discussing things that they go around in circles you know they're like on the the, the, the spiritual treadmill to oblivion and they're not getting anywhere with people and the reason that they're not getting any, anywhere with people is because they're speaking to people who have no foundation of understanding of what you're trying to share with them. So the greatest fault that a person who understands the Word of God rightly divided can be guilty of is to argue a biblical doctrine that belongs to right division with someone who does not understand right division. Amen. That is like, the to it is a disservice to them and it is a disservice to you. Because rather than make progress with that person, you close the door in that person's life because, you know, rather than helping them understand you create a barrier between yourself and the person that you're trying to help. Then they close the door on you. They don't want to hear from you anymore because they think you're a wacko because what you're saying is not what their pastor teaches. And they can't understand anything other than what they've learned and you're not doing it the right way. You're not sharing something with them the right way. So I'm going to help you today. I'm going to help you and show you something that really, really works. Several years ago, I was in a local subway shop, and I was waiting in line. And I noticed a man sitting in the corner. He was reading his Bible. So when I got my sandwich, I went and I sat to the closest table to him, which was the one right next to him. 
And at, you know, at, a, at a point, I asked him, you know, what book he was reading in and where he went to church. And we had a little conversation. After I was done eating my sandwich, I went and sat down at his table with him. And I took out a subway napkin. And I drew the timeline on the napkin. The whole thing. And that man sat there mesmerized by me doing it on an insignificant piece of napkin. Later on that day, when I arrived home, do you remember? Okay, it, it was like 10 years ago or 12 years ago. It was quite a while ago. I got home and she said, you got a phone call from a guy. Oh, when I left, I put my phone number on, on the bottom of the thing. He wanted the timeline, right? He was like, you know. So I got home. She said, you got a phone call from a man you met at Subway. He said he's got some questions that he wants to ask you. And so I tried calling him. And as much as I tried getting back in touch with him, it was like to no avail. It, 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 he, we never got back together again. But one thing I knew is I knew that he was totally, totally convinced and totally getting it. And he had questions about it. And unfortunately, it, it didn't work out. Now, fast forward to a year and a half ago when I went to Fort Lauderdale to visit Dr. Dada and his wife, Terry, the chiropractor who was here a few weeks ago, right? He shared with us, right? And everybody loved that. And while we were there, while I was there with them, we went to a restaurant. And as we were talking, he asked me a Bible question. I took out a napkin. I put it on the table and I drew out the timeline answering his question okay now i left it at that answered the question he kept the napkin i believe i think he kept the napkin when they came to visit a few weeks ago my wife and i went out with terry and her husband dr dada to a local restaurant he shared with us that when i was in florida when I drew the timeline on the, on the napkin, that was when his eyes were opened to right division. Now, he'd been studying with us for a few years, so he knew right division. But when it was drawn on that napkin, for some reason, his, he got, it was like, it was like, you know, you get the aha moment when you realize, you know, the stoning of Stephen, Paul, the rapture, right? And so, I'm telling you this to let you know that a lowly napkin, you know, God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, what is more foolish than a napkin? What is more non-threatening than a napkin? Absolutely nothing. Okay? So, what I'm saying is that something so simple and so non-threatening as a napkin is the way that you can speak to people, that you should speak to people, when you are trying to explain the Word of God rightly divided. Okay, so what we're going to do today is we're going to take this piece of paper. Not mine, you can't have this one. I'm going to do it up here. But we're going to take this piece of paper and we're going to draw out the timeline together. And again, those of you who are watching by way of internet, you do the same thing right now. Get a piece of paper and do this exercise, and I'm going to teach you something, okay? And what we're going to do is, the, is just a basic outline 
with not a lot of filler because you don't need a lot of filler when you're doing this for someone who doesn't know anything about the Word of God. There will be a couple of salient points that will draw as we, as we just produce a simple out, uh, timeline. And then the way that you remember how to do it is when you get up in the morning, first thing you do, you get yourself a piece of paper and you just draw it without the other one there to remind you. And if you forget, you look at, oh yeah, that goes there. And then you do it again at noon. And then you do it again at night. And then you do it the next morning. And you do that for a whole week. And then at the end of the week, you will be an expert at drawing the simple timeline. Simple, right? And, it, and when you get to sit down with someone, if that, if that happens, you will be an expert. You will look like you know what you're talking about. And let me tell you, that's 99% of the battle. That's 99% of the battle. Knowledge is power. You know, when I, did, when I was a sales trainer and I taught people how to close the sale, I used to tell them, I'm going to teach you all these things, all these methods of helping people make decisions that are in their own best interest. You have to learn these things that I'm telling you. You have to study them. You have to memorize them. And here's what will happen. Chance favors the prepared mind. If you're ready to give them an answer to a, to a concern they have about your product, you will be the one who closes the sale. I know. All right, I closed over 5,800 sales on the first call with people I had never met in my life and walked away with 50% deposits. Okay, I know how to close the sale and I would teach them. And I taught some men who became very successful in, in sales because they listened to what I said. Even Amy, when Amy showed up at our office and I taught her how to set an appointment. I taught her how to, she's the only girl that ever worked for us who set the appointment the way I told her to do it, and she set perfect appointments every time. Because she did it the way I said to do it. There's certain words that you have to use and you have to learn them, and I had written out a script, and she followed that thing. She was the best we've ever had in our life. Because chance favors the prepared mind. So what we're going to do is just imagine that you're sitting in a restaurant with someone. Okay, And, you know, the key to sharing right division is if a biblical question comes up, rather than address the question, because they're not ready for the answer. You know, they're not ready for anything you're going to say, ever, at any time. Whether it's, oh yeah, well, there's more than one gospel in the Bible. No, there's only one gospel. Well, no, there's more than one gospel. Look, Peter said, da, 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 da. Whatever, whatever it is, whatever the subject is, they, ha they cannot enter into a discussion with you. They don't know what you know. So what do you do? You catch up, you catch them up to who, where you are. Because unless they understand the basic, fundamental, elementary things of the time, God's perfect timeline in His Word, okay? So you have pencils, you have paper, pens, okay? Now, I don't know how well this is going to go, but you, what you want to do is you want to draw two lines, okay? One, the top one is, goes to about halfway, halfway to the, 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 the halfway mark. The bottom one goes beyond it, probably like half an inch or something, right? And the reason you do that is because later, later at the fall of Israel, you'll already have you already have your angle, okay? That's why the top one is a little bit shorter than the bottom one. So I take the top one, 
and bring it halfway, and then the bottom one past it. Half an inch, an inch, whatever, okay? And then you draw another line going down. Now just imagine you're sitting in a restaurant and a subject comes up and you say, and you grab out a napkin. Say, let me show you something. Guess what? There's no argument about that. There's no argument about writing, making lines on a, on a napkin. Nobody's going to argue with you about that. You know what they're going to do? They're going, huh, what, what's he doing? Wow. This is so powerful. Now I realize how powerful it is. Okay, I didn't realize how powerful it was. You know that in the, like in the insurance industry or in the financial industry, like if you're going to sell somebody an annuity or you're going to sell them an index universal, like whatever, you're, you start drawing things on a napkin. Okay, a lot of financial planners, that's what they do. They'll draw things on a, they're called napkin presentations because they're the least threatening way to explain a benefit to somebody where, like our, we have the timeline, right? The timeline, it all opens up. Well, you take that out in a restaurant, it's all done for you. This is more powerful than that. This is more powerful than that, okay? So, you, okay, the first thing you're gonna do is gonna go, who was the first person in the Bible? Adam, right? Adam, right? Adam down there. Now you're just gonna fill in things as we go along, okay? And you'll, you'll, you've heard this so many times, you'll, you know. So Adam is the first person in the Bible. From Genesis 1 to Genesis chapter 11, the world is in a downward spiral. You know, Noah's flood. By the time you get to Genesis chapter 11, God looks down on the world and says, I'm going to flood it again. I'm going to kill them all. Or, I'm going to do something about this. So he looks down and he spots Abraham over there in Ur of the Chaldees, Abram, right? And he separates Abraham from all the nations of the world. And he creates the nation of Israel. In the Bible, the nation of Israel are called the circumcision, C-I-R. I know it's not that dark for you guys. I should have made it bigger, but. Israel, circumcision, C-I-R. So God separated Abraham from all the Gentiles and created the nation of Israel. They're the circumcision, the Gentiles are the uncircumcision. All right? They were under the law. They were under the law. Everybody knows that. This is Genesis to Malachi. G-E-N to M-A-L. Now, when these two groups of people Circumcision and skirt. in the Old Testament, there's a middle wall of partition between them. You find that in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14. Ephesians 2, verse 14. Now on my Bible, on my on my, on my Bible, on my on my phone, I have a Bible. I have a Bible. It's called My Sword. My Sword Bible app. It's great. You can go to Ephesians 2.14 real quick and you can read to him. About, you can read to the people about the middle wall of partition. Sal, do me a favor. Shut that light for a second. See, see if it, it works better.
Is that better? Middle wall. Below that. Genesis to Malachi. Okay. What's up that? The word right above Genesis. Law. Cir uncircumcision. Circumcision, uncircumcision. Here's the point you make at this juncture. When, when there's a middle wall of partition between the circumcision and the uncircumcision, the body of Christ does not exist. Right? That is like the main point you're trying to drive home at, for, for people. There is no body of Christ here. With this, you can understand that. It's not that it's not complicated. In Ephesians chapter 2, the Bible calls this time past. Time past. Then, when we arrive to the four Gospels, there's 400 years of silence between Malachi and Matthew. Okay, you got Matthew to John in these lines right here. Draw another line going down. Sorry, I should have made all these lines thicker. <laughs> I did it on my computer. I'm like, I can see this good. But you can see you got a line coming down. You got Matthew to John. Okay? The point you're driving home is in the Old Testament, there was a middle wall of partition between Jews and Gentiles. So what did Jesus Christ tell his disciples to do in Matthew? Look here, Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 and 6. What did he tell them? Go not unto the Gentiles. So what does that mean? It means that the middle wall of partition still exists. And if the middle wall of partition still exists, there's no body of Christ. You see that? So what you're doing, when, when, you, when, when, a, when we have the timeline up here, what we're showing is that there's a middle wall of partition and the body of Christ does not exist under the Old Testament. Right? Now, this is very basic. I'm not adding anything in there. I'm not adding Romans 15, 8. I'm not adding things in Exodus that the Lord separated you from all the nations of the world. I'm not adding any of that. All you want somebody to see is, is this for now. Okay? And then he came unto his own, his own received them not. On the cross, most people will never know this. Most people will never know that in Luke chapter 13, verses 6 through 9, you write that right up there, LK 13, 6 through 9. Israel received a one-year extension of mercy. Luke 13, 6 through 9, verses 6 through 9. These three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree. Why cumbereth it the ground? Cut it down. The Lord said, no, leave it alone this year till I shall dig about it and dung it. Then after that thou shalt cut it down. Okay? So for one year after the cross, one year after the cross, notice, Jews only. Jews only. Peter and the twelve, Peter is preaching to the men of Israel, the Jews only. Okay? And if they're preaching to the Jews only, what still exists? The middle wall of partition. And if the middle wall of partition exists, there is no body of Christ. There is no body of Christ. 
And then in Acts chapter 7, they stoned Stephen. In Acts 7, they stoned Stephen. And in Romans chapter 11, verse 11, Romans 11, 11, chapter 11, verse 11, Paul said, Romans 11, 11. Is there anything you can't see? Is that see? You can see that good on the screen, right, John? You better do it, because I told you a while ago, there's the door. <laughs> okay, so. I'm joking. So, okay. So, after the stoning of Stephen, the apostle, Romans chapter 11, 11, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but through their fall, salvation has come to the Gentiles. And then you put, make a circle, and you write in there, Grace, Paul, Acts 9. And Paul said, there's no difference between Jews and Gentiles. For the first time in the Bible, there's no difference between Jews and Gentiles because in the body of Christ, who, is, who can be in Christ today? Jews and Gentiles can be in Christ. Right? There's a guy on the internet, he's teaching that we teach that Jews cannot be in Christ. Hyper-dispensationalists. He's lying through his teeth. Talking about Robert Breaker. He's lying through his teeth. He's a dishonest man. Okay? So... Acts 9, and then, you see, you already know, Paul wrote Romans to Philemon, right? You put that under there, Romans to Philemon, under the circle. And then you know that the, this, this is called the dispensation of grace, and it will end with the rapture of the church, right? I can tell you something right now, you can stop right here on your napkin. You've gone far enough to help that person understand something they never knew about their Bible. And they will be so thankful. Okay? But then, after the rapture, is the, seven, is the tribulation period. You make another line, the tribulation period. And Hebrews to Revelation has to do with that subject. Well, that's why you want to practice it. You want, that's why you want to practice doing it. I'll tell you right now, if you can ever do this in front of someone, and it's not difficult, and you can do it by what I told you. You do it in the morning, you do it at noon, you do it at night. Do it in the morning, noon, night. Morning, noon, night. You do that for a week. You will be an expert at drawing this, and if you ever sit down with someone... I guarantee they will see it. What's that word next to the grace? Right there. Uh, right next to the grace right here. What's that? T-R-I-B. Trib. Tribulation. That's what you would expect after the rapture, right? Right. Okay. So this is a napkin presentation. Notice I didn't even go further into the kingdom and all that. Because this is where you, you want to catch them up to you here. This is where we live here. You want to bring them through all this to here where there's no more middle wall of partition. That's when you can read Ephesians 2.14 again and say, that's what Paul is talking about. And there isn't a person, I promise you, there isn't a person sitting there who watches you do this who can argue with one thing that you have to say next. They just can't. 
because you've shown them the whole Bible from a bird's eye view. Then if you want to, you can lead them to that video. The, you want to see this in detail? Bird's eye view of the Bible. Because <laughs> I do this in detail. All I fill in all the blanks as we go, right? This is the basic fundamental elementary timeline for your basic garden variety denominational believer. Yeah, right? Clear? Shouldn't be any questions, right? No. No, I don't. I just did it. No, I just did it. I know, but I was going to take your paper. Oh, yeah, nice. You get a DVD, remember? You see it clear. Right. All right, John, how much time do we have left? Did you start that? You didn't start that clock. Okay. So, let's continue with Colossians chapter 1. We've reached a critical point in, in the epistle to the Colossians. In verse 2, we find the two most important words in the Word of God. Colossians chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Anyone see what the two most important words are in the Word of God in those verses? Grace and peace. Grace and peace. Why are they the two most important words in the Word of God? Last week after church, we went to lunch. I, saw, I sat across Jim. And he told me about something that he had done. That he looked up the word grace in the whole Bible. And he noticed that in most instances where the word grace is found, it's associated in the context of finding grace. Or somebody found grace in the eyes of the Lord. For instance, notice Genesis 6-5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, and it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In other words, from God's perspective, Noah found grace in his eyes. Okay, But think about this. The whole world was condemned to death except one person and his family. There are people who say grace always existed. From the Garden of Eden, grace all the way, you know, people who don't want to rightly divide the word of truth. That's what they say. Oh, grace always existed. You really want to say God, grace existed in the days of Noah when only one man and his family were saved from judgment? Really? Does that make sense? You know, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord is not a dispensation of grace. It is one isolated extension of grace. Noah was not looking for grace. Noah didn't even know grace existed. 
in the world in that day. But God did. And God is the one who decided to bestow grace upon Noah. And as a result of that, one man and his family found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So what I want you to notice is that he found, he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, he wasn't looking for it. It's from God's perspective, right? The grace is in the eyes of the Lord. Now, in this instance, the next instance, Jacob is begging Esau. Genesis 32, 5. And I have oxen and asses, flocks and men servants and women servants, and I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find grace in thy sight. See, people in the Old Testament were hoping to find grace. They were hoping to find grace. This is when Joseph meets Pharaoh. Genesis 39, 4. And Joseph found grace in his sight. And he served him and he made him overseer over his house. And all that he had, he put into his hand. This is when Joseph's brethren plead with Joseph. Genesis 47, 25. And they said, Thou hast saved our lives. Let us find grace in thy sight, my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. This is when Joseph's father was being buried. Genesis 47, 29. And the time drew nigh that Israel must die. And he called his son Joseph and said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh and deal kindly with and truly with me, bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt. Even Moses had an experience of grace with God. Exodus 33, 12, And Moses said unto the Lord, See thou sayest unto me, Bring up this people, and thou hast not let me know whom thou wilt send me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name, and that thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way, that I may know, that I may find grace in thy sight, and consider that this nation is thy people. Verse 16, For wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight? It is, is it not that thou goest with us? So shall we be separated, and I, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth. And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. I think you're getting the point, right? People in the Old Testament found, they found something, okay? It wasn't available to all the people all the time. Just a few more verses. I'm not going to give all the context of them, but Numbers 32, 5. Wherefore said they, if we have found grace in thy sight, let this land be given unto thy servants for a possession and bring us not over Jordan. Judges 6, 17. And he said unto him, if now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. Ruth 2.2, 2. and Ruth the Moabite is said unto Naomi, let me now go to the field and glean ears of corn after him in whose sight I shall find grace. And she said unto her, go my daughter, 1 Samuel 1.18, and she said, let thine handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more. Second Samuel 14, 22, And Joab fell to the ground on his face and bowed himself and thanked the king. And Joab said, Today thy servant knoweth that I have found grace in thy sight, my lord, O king, in that the king hath fulfilled the request of his servant. Ezra 9, 8. Notice this verse. And now for a little space, grace hath been showed from the Lord for a little space. 
We're going to dribble a little bit of grace here for a moment. Okay? Now you get the idea. Under the old economy, grace was not available except at certain times when people found grace in the eyes of the Lord or in the eyes of somebody in authority. Okay? There was no dispensation of grace. I mean, can you imagine? Can you imagine what it would have been like to live in a world where there is no grace? When you arrive at the four Gospels, the word grace is found four times. No, not one in each Gospel either. The first one is here, Luke chapter 2, verse 40, and the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Yeah, yeah, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Or, is that the Lord or John? John the Baptist, at chapter 3, uh, chapter 240. Whatever, who, <laughs> yeah. The other three instances of the word grace in the Gospels are all found in the same chapter of John, John chapter 1. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1, 16, And of His fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. John 1, 17, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now, to sum up these three verses in a nutshell, without going into a whole, you know, expository teaching about it, Jesus Christ came to Israel. He came to redeem them, right? Galatians 4.4. That's what it says, right? To redeem them who were under the law. Jesus Christ dying for the sins of that nation was an incredible act of mercy and grace. That's what that was, okay? But did they receive the grace that he brought to them? No, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. They took the one who was full of grace and truth, and they nailed him to a cross. What did that do for them? It forfeited the grace. It forfeited the grace that was sent to them and they stayed under the law. Now you remember Peter, one of the twelve. Later on, when he speaks about grace, this is what he says. Wherefore, gird up the loins, 1 Peter 1.13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you. Wow. So think about that. In time past, there was dribbles of grace every once in a while in somebody's life when they found grace in the eyes of the Lord. In the Gospels, in the four Gospels, grace came. The fullness, the embodiment of grace came to them. Wow. They rejected it. So their program was postponed and pushed out into the future as a result of that. And now, and now grace is spoken of something that will come to them at the revelation of Jesus Christ at the end of, Dan of Daniel's 70th week, at the end of the tribulation period. But what do we have? Remember on the road to Damascus? Saul of Tarsus breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. And grace manifested in the flesh appeared to him on the road to Damascus. 
And when grace appeared to him, it said, Saul, Saul. Think about that moment. That was a manifestation of God's grace. Later on, Paul would write about that experience on the road to Damascus, and this is how he would say it. For second, uh, Titus chapter 2, verse 11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. That appeared right there on the road to Damascus when Saul of Tarsus was arrested by the very manifestation of the grace of God in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. That is possibly the most monumental event to ever take place on the stage of human history except for the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Amen. That event right there, when he appeared, grace appeared to all men. All men. Not a person here, not a person there, here, once in a while. Grace appeared to all men and is available to all men without distinction. Old, young, rich, poor, children, adults, doesn't matter what country you're from. Grace appeared to all men. That is a far-reaching truth. Grace just covers the earth today. And you know, and you think about countries that ban the preaching of the gospel in their countries. They ban the offer of free grace. Sad thing is, they're even beginning to ban it in our country. Okay? Tells you how blind men are to their own need and their own condition and the depth of their sin in that they would reject the only solution for their sin. Think about that. Reminds me of a story I heard many years ago about a man who had purchased the cheapest tickets he could find on a cruise ship. <laughs> yeah, right? As they were cruising one day, one of the stewards was walking past this man's cabin and the door was open and he noticed the man was sitting there with some crackers and cheese. And the steward said, Sir, what are you doing? I'm having lunch. Lunch? Sir, come with me. And he takes them to this dining hall that has the largest outlay of food, the spread of food that he has ever seen in his life. And the steward said, sir, this is where you need to eat lunch and breakfast and supper. And the man said, but I purchased the cheapest ticket on this ship. It didn't include the buffets. And the steward said, sir, all tickets on this cruise include all the food you can eat at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So the man not only was shocked, but he was disappointed because for four days he'd be eating cheese and crackers. Okay? You know, the moral of the story is this. The entire world is in the same boat. This boat is sinking. There is a lifesaver that is available to every person on this boat. It's called Calvary. All those who partake of it by faith are rescued from the sinking ship. How sad will it be for multiplied millions of people when they find out that the same grace that saved millions of people, some of whom they knew, was also available for them, but they rejected it. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men without distinction. Imagine what Paul felt like 
when he realized, Acts 20, 24, none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Here's a man who knew nothing about grace. Here's a man who grew up in a world where there was no grace. Here's a man who knew only the law. You know, I frequently think about Paul. I do. You know, he's my apostle. I try to imagine what it must have been like the day he was arrested on the road to Damascus. The, one, the ones he's been persecuting are the ones who are the followers of this Nazarene that he hates. He's hailing them to prison, and he's having them put to death. Then all of a sudden, a light above the brightness of the noonday sun hovers above him. Saul, what are you doing? And then he receives of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Like I said a few moments ago, the most monumental event to ever been played out on the stage of, of, of human history is this event right here with this man, apart from the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. A new method of salvation is introduced to this man, and it's salvation by grace where men can be saved without lifting a finger. Without lifting a finger. Being saved by grace means that all the religions in the world who say that you can work your way to heaven are wrong. They're lying. Now the only thing grace will accept is a response of faith. Faith is the only thing you can do without doing anything. So grace does require something from you. It requires the corresponding response, and that response is faith. And faith activates God's grace. Faith sets in motion the process of your salvation. When you respond to grace with faith, God responds to your faith by forgiving you of everything you've ever done. At the same time, He baptizes you into the body of Christ. At the same time, He imputes the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ to your account. At the same time, you who were dead in trespasses and sin are made alive with Christ. At the same time, you're made to sit with Christ in heavenly places. At the same time, your eternal destiny is changed and can never be altered after that moment. All that happens. Many things happen when faith activates grace and when grace gets the response that it's looking for from you, which is faith. Then, okay, after you've been saved by grace, guess where you're standing? Huh? Romans 5, 2. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand. Once grace accepts your response and does all those things to you, then it leaves you standing in it. It takes you out of the law. It takes you out of the condemnation of the law. It takes you out of the wages of sin, which is death, and it plants you in grace. What a garden to be in. According to this verse, we have access, we access grace by faith. Once we access, we have access to grace, that's where we stay. Okay? We stand in the grace of God. There's no safer place in the world to be than in the grace of God. I mean, would you rather be standing in your own works and your own self-righteousness? Hey, God, look what I've done for you. 
You think about a fallen child of Adam thinking, oh, I'm okay with the guy upstairs. You know, I've got something I'll give you for e the free gift of eternal life. You wouldn't want that, would you? Standing in the grace of God is not your choice. It's God's choice. You know why he puts you there? Because he knows you're a total failure. That's why. That's why. He puts you there because he knows you're totally incapable of producing anything that he can accept. He puts you in his grace because he remembers your frame, that you are but dust. He knows you need grace. So what does he do? He plants you in the garden of his grace. That's what he does. He knows there's not a work you could do on this earth that could earn you even one minute in heaven. God knows that. He knows that nothing you've ever done would even earn you the right to just take a peek inside the door and look into heaven. Nothing you've ever done. Because everything we've done is tainted by some bias, some prejudice, or some pride, or something. Something in, human na in your human nature. Rendered any work you did for God null and void. But when grace is activated by faith, whew, it gives you the whole ball of wax. Lock, stock, and barrel. Hook, line, and sinker. You get it all. You get it all. Just because you place your faith in what God said to place your faith in. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. Grace and peace, the two most important words in the entire world. Matter of fact, grace and the corresponding faith equals peace with God. This could be called the holy trinity of salvation. Grace Faith and peace. It's so important that Paul begins all his epistles with grace and peace. It became the dispensational salutation whereby he greets all the people that he writes to forever. Nothing is greater. Nothing is greater. And that's why he said, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God and Timotheus, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing is more important than that. Amen. Amen. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you were saved by grace, through faith, and now you have peace with God. Wow. Let's pray. Our gracious God and our Father, we're so thankful this morning that we had grace, we had faith, and now we have peace. The peace of God that passeth all understanding, which keeps our hearts and minds. Thank you, Lord, for your great salvation. Thank you for the peace that comes with it. Thank you for what we have in Christ. None of us can ever be more thankful enough for what you have done for us in sending your Son to take our place and pay the penalty for our sin and, and bear the wrath of God on our behalf. I thank you for all these things today, Father, and I pray if anyone doesn't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, that today they will just bow their heart before God, acknowledge their guilt, and allow their faith to rest 
on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and be absolutely confident that His blood is capable of forgiving every sin they've ever committed and that by faith they receive the free gift of eternal life. I pray these things today in that name that is above every name, the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, folks, folks online, Facebook, YouTube, thank you for being with us today. And uh, hopefully we'll see you next week. And remember that you're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Amen. See you.